So today, I got a call from a brother uh, uh, who I, I just found out, I think it was a week or so ago, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks now, that uh, him and his wife were expecting. At one time, they were a part of this ministry, and I think that they still consider themselves a part of this ministry. And uh, so we were rejoicing with him that um, he and his wife are expecting a child. And uh, uh, I asked him, you know, today, I said, what do you, what do y'all desire? He said, well, we both want a girl. We both want a little girl. And so we're going to lift them up in prayer that the Lord will give them their, their heart's desire that it'll be a little girl. So let's, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you, first of all, thanking you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to make it here today and to hear what we've heard so far. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to lead us through this service and that you will be glorified, Lord, with the things that will be said. And Lord, we've come lifting this couple up to you who are expecting a child. We ask, Lord, first of all, that you will... Um, be with them during this pregnancy, Lord, that uh, the wife will have a safe pregnancy, that there will be no complications. And, Lord, we come asking you to grant them their desire to, for a little girl, Lord, and we pray that she is raised uh, in the admonition of you, that she will be used by you to glorify you, Lord, and, and that you will use this little girl to, to bring many people to you, not only through... Uh, ministry, but also through her life and and testimony, Lord. We thank you so much for this uh, blessing that you have blessed them with. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to open up doors for them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I just felt led to do that. Uh, some of you, most of you have heard my testimony. Uh, really, I guess it's my mother's testimony. Uh, her and my father got married in 1969, and uh, uh, I was my mother's for firstborn. But I, I didn't get here until 1974. And for those years, my mother, you know, wanted to be have a child, and uh, she prayed and prayed for a son. And uh, she prayed the same prayer that Hannah prayed, that, Lord, if you will give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And so that's why I say, you know, that um, I... Uh, ever since I've known that I've existed, I've known that uh, I was a servant of the Lord. You see, uh, uh, my father died in 1981, just six years after I was born. And But I can remember being called. Uh, my mother had called for me uh, to get out of the tub and come lay hands on him to pray for him. And that was uh, just a glimpse into how the Lord would uh, use me. And so we've been talking about predestination. And all of this goes into that predestination. Um, uh, I started having visions, I guess, around the age of four or five, that, as far as I can remember, you see. Uh, one of the first visions I had was looking in the sky and I saw uh, the Lord bearing down on Satan. Just like, you know, he was a defeated foe. I understood that. Now, you know, I never thought about it. Why the Lord would show me him bearing down on Satan. It was to let me know that for the rest of my life, that's to be my mindset. That the victory belonged to him and the people who serve him. That's, if you'll ever get that in your mind from day one, it makes the rest of your life easier to deal with. The victory belongs to those who serve him. You see that? It belongs to them who serve him. And so, you know, through the years, you know, the Bible tells us uh, that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Now, that's, that's, that's predestination there. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I'm what the Bible would call a seer. And that means I see things before they happen all the time. It's always been that way. And it's not always a good thing to see things before they happen because God isn't always showing you good things. And I've had people come to me and ask me, so how does that feel, brother? You, you, don't, you don't want to walk in that all the time, seeing things. Because sometimes you see loved ones leave here 
and, and you're spending time with them and saying goodbye to them, they don't even realize, you know, that it, it's a hard thing sometimes, you know, to deal with. But um, it, it, I've had people come to me uh, wanting that gift and asking me how it felt to be that way or, you know, asking me what they could do to be that way. But, you know, you have nothing to do with it, just like you didn't have anything to do with a male, uh, being a male or female. God made you what you are, and, and you just have to be that, what you are. You see that when you, uh, it's just like if you cooking beans, most time people cook it, cook beans in a big pot. You don't cook it in a skillet or on a frying pan. Those vessels weren't made for that. You see that? And so if we will ever just stick to being what God has made us to be, we do our part. And I'm, a, I'm afraid in the body of Christ, there's too many people trying to be somebody else. You see? And we just have to realize one vessel isn't better than the other. We all got our use and our purpose in the body of Christ. You see that? And so we just have to be who God made us to be. He told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You see that? Before you came out of the womb, I ordained you a prophet. Now, that he told Jeremiah that. You see that? That means God had a purpose for him. Yeah, God had a purpose for him. And we, we have to realize that, that God has designed us to be the way that we are, and he has a purpose for us. I don't know why <clears throat> the Lord waited for five years. You know, my, my parents, they were married for five years before I got here. But uh, I, I got here, and my mother, when she found out she was pregnant, as soon as she found out she was pregnant, she went all, out and bought all boy clothes. And people, even church folks, were ridiculing her, saying, you don't know what that child is going to be. And her response was, well, yes, I do, because the same God that answered my prayer about getting pregnant, he's going to finish it and give me a boy, just like I prayed for so I'm glad I'm a boy. Because <laughs> I don't think I'd have made a pretty girl. <laughs> I'm told, my daddy told uh, some, some relatives of mine, you better buy that girl some pretty clothes, you know, because she was. <laughs> Amen. So God is sovereign, and we have to understand that. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. You know, <clears throat> many people, this is something that the Lord had laid on my heart, many people have a problem with predestination. Because predestination, it puts God in control. And we live in a society that don't want God to be in control. We live in a society, and even among church people, where it is preached, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Now, in and of itself, that's not a wicked thing. God don't want you walking around with low self-esteem. He, he wants you to, you know, believe that you can accomplish things and things like that. But, you know, that has been pushed overboard, the believe in yourself. In fact, we don't find that in the Bible, believe in yourself. You come here full of yourself already. The Bible tells us to believe in God. Believe in God's ability to operate through us. You see that? And so when we believe in self, we tend to push God out of the way and we, we, we focus on our own dreams and, and things like that. And so people have a problem with predestination because they don't want to believe that God created them for a purpose. One of the most miserable people you'll, you'll meet in this world is somebody who have a lot of zeal, but not after God. 
they'll accomplish big things in life only to die and have to answer to a God that they did not recognize. It doesn't matter how rich you are, you can't buy a spot in heaven. And it takes us back to what the Lord told us in his word. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? You can gain the whole world and still lose your soul. And we have a whole world full of people who are being the best they can be, who are out there achieving a whole lot of things after the flesh and still miserable, still not happy, still not happy. You can be the richest person in the world and still not be happy. And people think, well, if I gather money, if I gather fame and all of these things, I'll be happy. And you get all those things and you're still miserable. Rich people get on drugs because they can't figure out what else is there. You know, but it's because God has placed on the inside of you something that only he can feel. There's a void there that only God can feel. And people spend their whole lives trying to fill that void with, with a spouse, with children, with a job, with houses, cars, and none of that means anything if you don't have God. You see that. And sometimes people find that, out the, find that out the hard way. And so people have a problem with predestination because they want to believe I'm, I, I, you know, I can live on my own. I can do whatever I want to do and these things like that. And even in all of that, you find out God is still in control. He's still in control. Every time mankind set up some kind of system thinking that we've outsmarted God, come, God will come right along and blow it all away. Years ago, they set up the stock market and they thought, this is a sure thing. This will never fail. This country is growing. It'll never fail. But it fell in 1929. And a lot of people committed suicide because they had their heart in what they had obtained in this world. You see that? And so that's not God's will. I tell you, it is. you can get a breath of fresh air when you serve the Lord with your whole heart. And, and then you begin to realize the deceitfulness of riches. Those things, they, they set up to deceive you. You see that? And so let's not, let's not fall into that. Let's not fall into that. So the ninth chapter of the book of Romans, we'll start reading at verse 1. It says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now this is Paul, he's talking about the Jews. He said his heart was heavy on behalf of his brothers, and notice how he said it, according to the flesh. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 4, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the services of service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So right there he's establishing all of the advantages, all of the things that the Jews brought into this world. The law came by them. The world knew God through the relationship that the Israelites had with God. He said, even the son of God was, was a Jew after the flesh. This is how he came. And so he caps that off with amen. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 6, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now that's why he made it clear in the earlier verse that his heart was heavy for his kinsmen according to the flesh. That what he's doing now is he's establishing the fact that the sovereignty of God have also brought in the Gentiles. Now that's for us today as well, that we don't need to think just because we're going to church that we automatically belong to God. The Bible makes it clear in this same book here, the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. And somebody came and challenged me on that idea. Uh, do you really think you can be led by God all the time? 
I said, I sure do, because when I was in the world, I was led by the devil all the time. That devil didn't give me a time out and say, okay, you can go play with God now. You got 10 minutes. <laughs> I was his all the time. And so we think when we come to God, we're supposed to be going back and forth. No, we're supposed to be led by that spirit all the time. All right. Verse seven. Verse seven says, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, the sovereignty of God is this. Just like it was back then, so it is today. Where people, they identify with Abraham and they think, I get a pass because I'm a descendant of Abraham. And, and what Paul is establishing here is, you don't, just because you're a descendant of Abraham, that does not automatically make you a child of God. This is why he tells us, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Abraham had another son named Ishmael, but he didn't belong to God. And then you read when his wife Sarah died, he married another woman and had six other children. Where are they in the promise? So what was the promise by Isaac for? Through faith, not by I was born the, the son or daughter of Pastor Bolden, and so that means I'm automatically guaranteed. It was by faith. You know, the man who replaced Moses was Joshua. But you know, Moses had two sons that we know of. Why weren't they his replacement? Why didn't God say, well, since this is your seed, this is your offspring, I'm going to use them. That right there lets you know that when God have called us for a purpose, we should fulfill that purpose and not get caught up in who we're kin to or who we think can open up doors for us. Because when you depend on people to open up doors for you and not praying to God, those same people can close doors and now you're disgruntled at God. Don't get mad at God because you didn't seek him out for doors to be opened. And that's what happens, you see. I told my wife when we first got married, you know, I never, and, and I shared this with a few other people, if I have a need, nobody will ever know about it. And not because I'm proud, too proud to ask. I ask God. And I let God touch the hearts of people so that when the need is met, I can say, thank you, Lord, because I know it was you that talked to them. I know it was you that, that led them. You see that? And, 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 and God wants us to walk by faith along those lines. He wants us to walk. That's what makes us his children. The Bible says without faith it is impossible. Now, that, that right there is the key to our whole salvation. Our whole relationship with God is based on faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. But why? Because without faith, you can't even be his son or daughter. The Bible makes it clear that Isaac, it was in him that the seed should be called. Why? Because Isaac was born by faith. Ishmael was born after the flesh. That was, that was man's idea. And to this day, the children of Ishmael and Isaac are persecuting one another. Why? Because somebody decided they were going to help God out. God, you made this promise to me. And I've been waiting for a while. I guess maybe, you know, the Bible says faith without works is dead. So I'm going to go out here. <laughs> and Christians will use that excuse to get out of God's will. <laughs> so <laughs> it makes me wonder how many Ishmael's have we produced in our lives that's conflicting with the eyes that, that God wants to bring forth. You see that? We have to be careful in that. Verse 8. It says, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And we see even when Jesus Christ came, he wasn't born after the flesh. Through the will of flesh. Does everybody understand? He didn't have a biological father. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and Jesus Christ was born. Now, 
That is a, an example of what happens, what takes place in our own spiritual lives. When the Holy Spirit overshadows us, we're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. We'll produce what God wants us to produce when we're being led by the Spirit, when that Spirit overshadows us. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 9, it says, For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Does everybody understand? Let's keep reading that. Verse 12, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That means that the children, when we are born after God, we have nothing to do with what God have called us to do. That, that's the reason why we don't have any business glorying in what God have called us to do. When my wife cooked dinner, I don't go to those pots and pans and say, Ooh, y'all, y'all did a good job. I go to the one who was doing the cooking, you see. The vessels had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and that's the way it is with, with the Lord. When we've been called, I'm going to tell you that devil is slick. It, when I first started preaching some 20 years ago, uh, people would, after I would get done, people would come up to me and shake my hand and say, oh, I really like that message. And I, my response was, thank you. And, and, and after about the third time of that, I got up to preach. And it was a pretty rough message that I had to preach. And so rough that some of the people were getting up and walking out. And uh, I was up there and I could tell I was up there by myself. I was stumbling over my words. And I just, I was having to think about what I was going to say, which is not something I have to do. You know, it's just the Lord to speak. And so while I'm up there preaching and, you know, kind of embarrassed, you know, not only that, but the word was harsh. And so people were getting up, walking out and shaking their heads and things like that because they didn't want to hear it. Now, it was the truth what was being said. I'm standing there thinking, Lord, what in the world is going on? And the Lord spoke to me and said, you thought it was you. So I'm just giving you a taste of what it is to be up here preaching by yourself. And he brought he brought to my remembrance. What was I saying? Thank you for. Why was I, in other words, me saying thank you, now I thought I was just being polite. But me saying thank you was me taking credit for what the Lord was speaking and how he was speaking it. See how subtle the enemy was? And of course, after the fact, I thank the Lord that he didn't let me to continue to walk down that path. You see that? You see that? And so we have nothing to do with who we are. In God, except obeying God and surrendering our lives to the Lord. You see that? And we have nothing to do with it. Let's keep reading verse 14. It says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You see that? You can have a will to do something. And we have to say this since we're here, especially since the Lord brought it to me. There are many people, when they get saved, they want the quote-unquote baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they begin to pray to God for the, the, the gift of speaking in tongues. And sometimes God will be merciful. But if God didn't create you to do that, does everybody see what the Holy Spirit is saying here? You can't make yourself do something that God hasn't given you to do. And we got a whole church world out there that don't believe, that believe if you are, are truly saved, you're going to speak in tongues. Now, no doubt, that is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it is still relevant for the day. But you know, if you go back to the 
to the uh, 16th chapter of the book of Mark. The Lord said they'll do that. But you know what else he said? They'll take up serpents and they won't harm them. I don't see many people doing that. <laughs> he was just explaining some of the events that would take place in some of the believers' lives. It says they shall cast out devils. But let me make this clear. It's not for everybody to cast out devils. You have to remain in the place that God have called you in. And not look across the street and get mad because somebody else is doing something that you want to do. If we all just play our part. There's a basketball player that plays for the L.A. Lakers that I'm not fond of. Because he reminds me a lot of uh, reminds me of a lot of believers. Some years ago when I was watching the Lakers, they were uh, um, uh, playing against a team and it was the semifinals and this this one fellow um, I guess he was used to being the top name and but this one over the hill basketball player he got the ball with three seconds left he shot up a three-pointer and won the game and the series his teammate did that you see the teammate was Robert Ory somebody that was considered kind of over the hill. He had already had his glory days and things like that. So he shot up the three-pointer and, and won the game and the series. And his own teammate walked off the court with his head down because he wanted to take the shot. Never mind the team won. And that's the way a lot of believers are. Lord, if you ain't going to use me in a situation, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Too many believers are looking for the spotlight and they don't know you think you're ready for it, but you're not. That's why the Bible tells us to be careful about ordaining elders. Make sure that they are not a novice, because if they are, the devil will exploit it and they will bring a name, a, a reproach on the name of God. It's too many people being put in offices. And in places that God did not ordain them to be in. And it's not because God thinks more of you than him or vice versa, whatever the case is. God have created you to be a certain way and that's what God intends for you to be. It all goes together. You see, it all goes together. It's, the Bible tells us that we are the body of Christ. And it goes on to name the different body parts. You know, and I don't have a favorite body part. They all serve their purpose. And I'm glad for every last one of them. I'm glad I can see. I'm glad I can hear. I'm glad I can eat and, and, and things like that. I'm glad for my hands. And so when I get in the shower or in the tub, I don't think, well, you know, I'm a, these are my favorite parts. So I'm just going to wash y'all. Forget the rest of them. I don't have a favorite body part. They all serve their purpose. And I'm not trying to use one to do everything. I can't chew with my hand. <laughs> and you know, it is time out in the church for the one man show where it's just one person and everybody else. Y'all just shut up, be quiet and let the Lord speak. I believe that all of these gifts are supposed to function in the church. And you may have one person that have all the gifts, but God wants to use some other people as well. And the Bible says that the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That means God might give it to me to speak in tongues. But just because I can come back and interpret, that don't mean I'm supposed to do that. I, give somebody else a chance to be used by God. That's what is missing in the body of Christ. You, you, everybody sitting out in the audience, just sitting there, waiting to be entertained by those, the select few. You know, God want, God want to use everybody. He didn't call us to sit down and just be quiet. Yeah, we're supposed to learn, and I believe that the word of God is supposed to go forth, but, you know, uh, all of our questions should be, God, what kind of vessel have you made me? What am I supposed to be doing? You see that? And if we'll all just stick to that, 
But, you know, unfortunately, in the body of Christ, there's envy, there's jealousy. If you want to see some mess, you just go join somebody's choir. Or you sit in, in some of the meetings that I've sit, sat in with uh, ministers. You'd be surprised what you hear and the things that are said. You see that. God wants to use people, but he wants to use them the way that he's created them to be used. And if we will ever learn to just stay in our place and to be what God has called us to be, we'd get more people saved. The Bible makes it clear that the, the a kingdom divided against itself, itself cannot stand. Now, let me make this clear. The devil don't fight against himself. He's not divided. The Lord said that when they accused him of being the prince of devils. He said, oh, no. No, no. The devil will never cast out a devil. Now, if the devil got enough sense not to be divided against himself, why is it church folks don't have that kind of sense? You read through, through the Old Testament, some of the wars that God himself fought. I mean, and when I say that, I mean he himself fought on behalf of his people. One of the things he used was confusion. He caused confusion in the camp to cause them to fight against one another and to defeat themselves. And when you have infighting going on in church, you, they're just moved to the side. You're not going to be used by God. Sometimes people have to be asked to leave. Either serve the Lord here and move all that junk out the way, or you got to go so the rest of us can move forward. Two million people came out of Israel, out of Egypt. Two, minute, two million Israelites came out of Egypt. And one day, Miriam and Aaron decided to have them a little Bible study against Moses. And if you continue to read that in the 12th chapter of Numbers, you'll see that God struck Miriam with leprosy. And the Bible says that the camp didn't move forward for a whole week waiting on God to heal her. All it took was a little backbiting to stop the whole camp of Israel. God didn't say, look, the rest of y'all move. Y'all go ahead and, and they'll catch up later. What is it? People don't want to remain in their place of calling. People want to be somebody else because they, for whatever reason, they think is more glory in being something else. Listen, most of the ministers that I have known personally, they wasn't running to the calling that God had for them, myself included. When God called Moses, Moses thought of every excuse he could think of not to answer it. And I tell you one thing I'm watchful for is somebody that's wanting to be something, that's ambitious for it. It's too much of that, too much flesh. You see that? The Bible tells us to let our light shine. It didn't say make it, it said to let it. And that means that whatever God has called us to do, we just have to allow it. You see that? When I, uh, the same brother I was talking to earlier today, you know, concerning his wife and the child there, uh, uh, that they're ex expecting and things like that, he asked me, he said, brother, have the Lord uh, given you what you're going to say tonight? He said, because I'm going to be listening in. I said, no, brother, the Lord hasn't given me anything. But you know what? And that's the way it is most of the time. I get up and don't have no idea what's going to be said. I just get up by faith and believe God is going to talk. But if I was forcing myself, making myself, well, I hadn't preached on love in a while. Lord, I'll get up and do that. I'd be in trouble. First of all, the Lord wouldn't be backing me up. And that's the way it is in our Christian life. We, you know, when you are a believer... You live like a believer because you are a believer. You're born that way. That's why the Bible tells us to be born again. I don't have to walk around trying to be, believe God or trying to be a Christian. I was born into it the same way I was born a male. I don't go out of my way to look like a man. I'm not painting this gold tee on and, and shaving my head. Now, you see a lot of, you know... Folks that are born females trying to be males and vice versa, they have to go out of their way to be that, to try to be that anyway. But no, when you're born into the kingdom, you're just going to live kingdom. That's all it is to it. 
And there's something wrong when we're not producing the fruit of the Spirit to actually be what God has called us to be. Amen. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 17. It says, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this cause, even for this uh, same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now, that is the reason why God raised us all up, that his power might be declared through us. And that his name may be great through all the earth. Unfortunately, we have many believers, and many preachers especially, that are too busy trying to make a name for themselves. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 18, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he, and whom he will he hardeneth. Verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who has resisted, who hath resisted his will? In other words, how can we say God is just if he have made somebody a certain way and then condemn them for it? Who can resist the will of God? Now, this is at the core of why people have a problem with the sovereignty of God and why they have a problem with predestination. How can God make a person to be a certain way and then condemn them for it? But you know the Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved. Unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If I stop right there, we'd all think God was unfair. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 20. Now, this is this is is God's reply to those who want to question him. Nay, but O man, who art thou that thou that replies against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, now this is the key here, and let's pay attention to what this says here. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Does anybody get what that's saying? He, what Paul is saying is, have you considered that those people who are fitted for destruction, God was merciful for, to them and was long-suffering towards them and they sealed their own fate? We read at the beginning of this series, it might have been part one or two, that it is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the will of God. God does not take pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. When God created hell, the Bible says it was made for the devil and his angels, not for unbelievers, for the devil and his angels. And the question have rung in my mind for years and years to ask people this. If the hell was made for the devil and his angels, why are we volunteering to go there? You see, you know what the agony is in hell? Why people are so distraught? What, what, the, tor what the real torment is going to be? Not the flames, not, the, not the, the suffering, but the fact that I didn't have to be here. It was my choice to be here. And the devil, you know, lets, makes us think we have all the time in the world. Tomorrow, I'll live for you, Lord. Tomorrow, I'll do this. Tomorrow, I'll get it together. Tomorrow, I'll be different. The only problem is tomorrow never be, get here. One day, time is going to run out. And we, that, the Bible calls it turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Where you think because you have grace today that tomorrow God won't cut it off. You see that at some point we have to be real and live for God for real and quit playing. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 23, it says, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy 
which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Let's go real quick, just real briefly to the second chapter of the book of Revelation. The second chapter of the book of Revelation, we're going to start reading at verse 18. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things said the Son of God, who hath his eye like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, when we think of that name, we think of one of the most notorious women in history. A woman who killed God's prophets just because they were different than her own. And she got a lot of men sitting at her table at a time when there was a famine going on and she made sure that they were fed. And some of those men sold their souls just to eat, the same way false prophets do today. And she killed God's prophets and destroyed the temple of God and the worship thereof. The God sent prophets to warn the people to turn back to him. You see, God sent Elijah. He challenged her false prophets on the Mount of Carmel. And God answered by fire and proved that he was God and that the God they were serving, which was Baal, was no God at all. And even after that, she said, by this time tomorrow, I'll have Elijah's head. She didn't say, well, you know, it's been proven. I'm going to serve the God of Israel now. She was a wicked woman. So much so, how many of us have ever grew up or know somebody with that name Jezebel? Nobody names their daughter that. Nobody. When you think of all the women in the Bible, she was one of the worst. In fact, when that name is said... Women cringe because their husband isn't saying that to give them a compliment. <laughs> no woman like being called a Jezebel. You see that? And so we may think God is so righteous, he just knows she's full of the devil and he just writes her off. But let's keep reading. Verse 21, he says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Everybody see that? The worst woman that you could think of in history, and God, being merciful, gave her a space to repent. God was saying, I'm willing to forgive you for all of the prophets you've killed, all of the turmoil. You brought people into false worship. I'm willing to forgive you for that if you'll repent. And what did this let us know? Even when predestination is involved and God knows where you're going, he still gives you another day to live to hope that you'll turn to him. That's the love of God. God's not like us because us, we, you just heard us one time. That's it. I'm writing you off. That is, it is over. I love you in the Lord. <laughs> God didn't make me to be nobody's doormat. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what. I'm so thankful the Lord is merciful towards us and don't think the way that we think because we'd be in trouble. That's why the Bible tells us to let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. He was forgiving people. 
He was not senile. And he, you know, when he chose Judas, he knew Judas was a devil. And we don't read anywhere in the Bible where he's just looking at Judas upside his head like, you so fake. <laughs> but you know, we'll do that. Put it on Facebook and everything else. <laughs> well, folks be gang banging on Facebook. <laughs> if words could kill, most of us would be dead by Facebook because <laughs> folks be writing up some stuff. <laughs> Ben, I guess I've just be thinking, I guess you just needed to get that off your chest. We're going to pray for you. That's too much to be going to sleep with. <laughs> but the Lord is merciful. And he put this scripture in here to let us know. If I gave Jezebel a space to repent... It means that your destiny, where you spend eternity, is up to you. And not, let's, not even, let's not think about eternity. Let's think about right now. The way your life turns out right now is up to you. You can choose to be lukewarm and never experience the true blessings of God. Or you could choose to move into the deep things of God. Because listen, it's those deep things that give us that zeal. To serve God. You see that? Those deep things. Years ago I had a dream. When I was pastoring this church. Uh, that I walked down to a water. To the water. They were in this lake. And they were standing in about a foot of water. And they were praising the Lord. And clapping their hands. And prophesying and things like that. And so when I got in that water with them. I said y'all let's go out to the deep. And they said no, no. We, we can't go out there. We'll drown. I said no the Lord won't let you drown. Let's go. And he's like, no, no, we can't go out there. And so the Lord spoke to me and said, well, you're going to have to go. So I went out to the deep. When I got out there, all of a sudden, I'm sitting in, a, in a, the living room of my uh, friend of mine who was uh, legally deaf and blind. And I asked him, I said, put your hand in my hand. And he, he put his hand in my hand. And when he did, the Lord healed him. And the Lord was showing me miracles don't take place in shallow water. It, 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 it takes place out in the deep. But it's too many people in the shallow water, they're satisfied. That was, I've been the pastor of that church for two years and the Lord was telling me, you're going to have to leave them because you've taken them as far as they want to go. Now that was a hard thing to hear, you know, that I had taken them as far as they want to go. But you know what I've learned? Some folks are just satisfied where they are. But I'm not going to be held back. And God don't want you to be held back. When folks are satisfied, you just have to let them be satisfied. And that's just the, the bottom truth. You, you can see what the commitment of people are. If people, you know, my wife, she say this all the time. People find time for what they want to find time for. And they'll find a way to make things happen that they really want to make happen. And if they really have a zeal for God, God is going to be number one in their life. Nothing is going to get in the way of that. You see that? And so I had to leave those people behind and go to the place that God was calling me to go to, you see. But this, this predestination, God has a place for you in him. And it's your job to fill that place. It's your job to get in that place, you know, that he has for you. God has destined greatness for you. Not according to the world's standards, but according to his standards. God has destined you to take your place in him. But if you don't take his place. What, other people are going to suffer. If you don't take the place that God has called you to take. Other people will suffer. When God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah went in the other direction. God didn't say. Well I knew you was going to do that. So I got another prophet on standby. No you're going to suffer. Until you get your mind right. And many people. Many believers today are suffering. Because they're out of God's will. Believe it or not, and I know sometimes folks have a hard time receiving this, there are some things God have called you to do that only you will be able to do. 
There are some people that God have called you to reach that only you are going to be able to reach. And if you don't get in your place, people are going to miss it. And you'll have to answer for those souls. You see that? You'll have to answer for that. And so when Jonah was in, in the belly of that great fish, repenting, God caused that fish to spew him out on the coast. And God called him again. Go to, that, go to Nineveh, that great city. You know what? He went that time. It wasn't that God didn't have other prophets, but he was made to do what God had called him to do. Historians tell us that Jonah was the son of the Shunammite woman. The woman who, her and her husband, uh, were uh, preparing a place for Elisha every time he came through. And then, of course, he had an accident when he was a little boy and died. And God, you know, sent Elijah to go lay on that boy and raise him from the dead. God knew what his purpose was then. And so here's the way you have to think. Did God keep me alive for all of these years for me to disobey him now that I'm supposed to be serving him? If God kept you alive, it's because you are called according to his purpose. God didn't keep you alive to disobey him and to dishonor him. Amen. So let's get in the purpose of God. All right. Now we want to say thank you all for coming out tonight. Brother Letty and his father and everyone that's here. We thank you for you coming. What, what is your name? Tia. I'm James' sister. Oh, okay. He did say that you were, he was going to invite you to come. Amen. Amen. We're glad to have you. Amen. We thank God for that. Amen. All right. We're grateful for everyone coming out. We pray that something was said that was a, a blessing to you. And, uh, of course, we don't always say this, you know, and I, sometimes I guess I take it for granted. Maybe people already know, but most of the time these messages, when they're preached on Sunday night, they'll be on YouTube in the morning just in case you want to go back and, <laughs> and uh, listen to them. We also have a podcast. Uh, you know, if you punch in our ministry name, you'll get that podcast as well. So we just try to put it out there for people to go back and listen to it because you'll be surprised how you can go back and listen to something and you'll catch something that you may have missed, you know, before. So we thank you all for coming and uh, we pray that God's blessings be upon you and now you're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.